So this video is a companion video to my original one on using World Machine with Terrain 3D in Godot. Uh, I got a comment from Ben, or Benj, asking to see how the computer shader is done. So here you go, Benj, this is for you. If anybody would like the code that I use in this video, leave a comment and I'll set up like a GitHub page or something like that. If there's any questions, comments, or whatever, or you want to see a video on a different topic, just also leave a comment and I'll make that too. Thanks. So this video goes over my method for importing splat maps using Terrain 3D for Godot. If you don't know what Terrain 3D is, it's a plugin for Godot that allows for some pretty great terrains. I love this plugin. I also love World Machine, and they don't really like each other. So to get Terrain 3D to speak to World Machine nicely, I had to make my own compute shader that rips apart the splat map and puts it together in a format that is readable by Terrain 3D. So let me go over the differences between this method and a method using regular splat maps. So a regular splat map might look something like this, where each channel represents uh, each material, right? So the red is one material, the green is another, blue is another. So this method provides a way to be able to use a regular texture file as a splat map without having to have like a billion different channels for the different billion different materials. So here's one of my splat maps, for example. In another splat map, this green color might be its own channel, this brown would be represented in its own channel, and this gold would be in its own channel, but that only allows as many materials as you have channels, unless you want to compress it. So logically, when you look at this texture, you know that this is supposed to be sand, you know this is supposed to be grass, you know this is supposed to be, well, in this case, it's a leaf cover, but it's probably not very obvious. And you know down here, where there's a gray here blending into a green, you know that's supposed to be gravel blending into grass. So that's how that code works. It just looks at this, looks at how much it's blended between the different colors to be able to determine which material and how much blending should occur on that part of the Terrain 3D mesh. Benefits of this, of course, is in programs like World Machine, it's much easier to make a texture like this than it is to make an individual splat map with blending that's applicable to Terrain 3D. So here in World Machine, I've just opened up a simple example file. And over here, using even what is inside of an example file, this basic coverage node actually gives you something that you can use directly as splat map. So down here, you could just set that to be the gravel, that to be the grass, and it will just automatically blend between those using this method, which makes it much easier. Inside of Terrain 3D, there are no real splat maps that you can import. Instead, all you have is the height, the color, and the control file. The control file is the best analogy, and that's what you really have to mess around with to be able to actually get this splatting to work. So the rest of this video is dedicated to how the code works, how my code works for this. The control texture for a Terrain 3D mesh is responsible for the base texture, the overlay texture, whether or not there is a hole in the terrain, whether a navigation has been set up for that terrain, and whether or not auto shader has been enabled on that part of the terrain. All that information is stored as a big texture in a .exr file format. So a terrain like this, which is 4096 by 4096, will require a 4096 by 4096 exr texture. What the control file is also responsible for is how much blending happens between the base material and the overlay material. So in this case, if we had the stone as a base texture, and each of these textures have their own height map that says how high above the ground they are. And if you put an overlay texture, the blend basically says how much this texture has been lowered such that the bottom one can show through. So here in Godot, the way I've set up my project is that adjacent to the importer scene, which comes with Terrain 3D, I had my own scene called the Terrain Compute scene. This scene I just used to be able to dissect the EXR and be able to convert the splat map into a control file. The scene is just set up with just a single node with a script on it, and that script just runs all the information when I play this scene. Nice and easy. So inside the code, the code is a little bit complex, but really what all it's doing is just setting up a compute shader and executing that when the game runs. So the information that I'm sending towards the compute shader is a control file, so I can mess around with it, a splat map, so that I can convert that splat map into a control file. The path to the shader, which I'm just ref referencing through a string, path to export the final EXR. I've also got down here a bunch of colors that represent each material inside of Terrain 3D. So the first one, so this first color represents stone, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, stone, then grass, then sand, then gravel, then leaf cover. And this will be representative of stone, then grass, then sand, then gravel, then leaf cover. I've just got to set up like this for, because uh, 
I'm not too thorough. <laughs> uh, you could really set it up, set this up such that it displays all the materials here or something and have its own custom color picker here. I don't really care. This is just a vanity project anyway. So I just color pick exactly the color that I want. So all that information, the splat map, the control file, those material colors, they all get compressed into a compute shader and that compute shader just gets executed and the output image is taken out. So the way I've set up my buffers in the shader looks like this. So over here, this is my control file, the, the one that I'm putting in. Uh, this is, you don't really need this if you're just converting a splat map directly into an EXR, but if you want to play around with that control file and see whether or not you can see how it works in code, you, you'll need a buffer to be able to save that. I just, you just save it as a U int because the EXR is just an integer for each pixel. This control file out is actually what I'm using to output the new control file from the splat map. Params is just my parameters buffer. So I, I have my own custom struct here that has how many materials that's used later in the code. So I just send that in as a buffer of a struct. I have a display buffer. This one I use to be able to display what I'm messing around with. So down here in the code, I've actually, after I finished actually exporting it, I display what I just did so that I, uh, as like a debug. I have the splat buffer. So this is, this is just the splat texture that I just input as a uint, same deal as the control file in. And finally, I have my material data, which is another struct. And this just has what all the colors are. So that, that is what this is. So all these colors are sent to the GLSL shader. I'm actually using a compute shader manager because I'm lazy and I'll link to the GitHub on there. Basically, it just makes it so you just have to do this instead of having to, you know, write like 20 extra lines. This just shows that I'm just adding a pipeline, which, and it just inputs each of the buffers one by one after one after one. So for the first one, of course, that's a control file. That's the control file I'm going to be getting out. Uh, the parameters where I have the material count that I was just saying about. The display data, the splat data, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, here is display texture that I'm actually just debug displaying. When I execute the shader, then it gets the data from the buffer. First, I get the display data, and I, I just set the display texture, which is just an object in my scene, this one here, so I can see what's actually happening. And then finally, the control file gets output from the output buffer, which is set down here in the GLSL shader. And then I'm just saving that image as an EXR. Uh, I'm kind of flying over this because I assume if you're watching this, you already know how computer shaders work. Uh, if you want to uh, a, one, a Compute Shaders 101 video, just leave a comment and I'll make one for you. Otherwise, uh, there are other resources you can learn how to do this. Uh, have a look at the Compute Manager GitHub page that I put down there if, you're, if you want to know, just if you don't know how to set up Compute Shaders from the get-go. So here in the importer scene down here, we have an export file option. And this allows you to be able to take your terrain that you've already created and export it as a control file. This is very useful in figuring out how the control file works. So I'm gonna mess around with this and edit the terrain a little bit just so we can see. So now I've made some alterations to it. I can run an export here and that will just save a file onto my disk. So now here in my own terrain compute scene, uh, adjacent to the importer scene, I'm going to be importing that texture that I just created. So now you can see it's imported. And what I can do is I can go into the GLSL shader and actually set it up so it shows exactly what was on that control file. So this code works like this. Basically, it just gets the ID that this specific pixel is. It decodes the data from the in file. Uh, it takes the base ID, read from the EXR we just created, and it just basically just puts it directly onto the display. So nice and easy. We'll go back to Godot and we'll run that and we should be able to see our little smiley face. And there you go. There it is. A little smiley face and a little test. Just like that. So basically what this is saying is that you can actually grab the data from the EXRs that you save. Uh, the way you actually do that is a little bit more complex. I'll show you how this one in particular does it. So here in the Terrain 3D documentation, you can see that the control map stores the base texture as a set of bits inside of the EXR. So a regular texture, of course, you know, it might have the red, the green, the blue, and the alpha channel. Each of those might be a number with a certain amount of bits in it. In this particular case, the control map, no, there is no red, green, blue, and alpha. There's just one number, and that one number has all the data compressed into those bits. So the base texture ID is the first five bits, or at least the bits between 32 and 28. Very conveniently of them, they've left us an encode and decode uh, section, and this uh, will help us when trying to decode the data out of the EXR. 
So back in the shader, you can see over here where I'm inputting the control file. I'm reading the data from that specific pixel and I'm decoding it into a struct. And that struct I've created up here. And so this basically just has, you know, the base ID, the overlay ID, the blend, the whole, the exact same thing that you saw from this here. It's just these things here, but put out into a struct. So to be able to unpack that pixel into this struct so that I can read the base ID, the overlay ID and all that, I basically just run it through a decode data function. And up here, you can see, this is how that function works. It just takes the input data, which is just a, a uint. That's that single big number that was in the texture to begin with for that pixel. And I create a new struct using GLSL. I, <laughs> I really don't like how GLSL actually works with uh, creating structs. You literally just like throw it in like this. That's how the constructor works. Anyway, so uh, each of these specific sections relate to each section of the struct. So if this first number here in GLSL just immediately puts that number, whatever that decodes to, into the BID, which is the base ID. And you might be able to recognize this. This number right by 27 and 0x1f, that is the exact same as this Decode, right here. There are tons of resources available where you can understand encoding and decoding bits, uh, especially to do with compute shaders. Uh, my personal experience, I've been doing it for quite a while now. Uh, I learned mine through making like Minecraft terrain through Unity and stuff like that, uh, where compressing data was uh, imperative to actually displaying anything. Anyway, so taking that logic, we can see we're decoding all the different parts into the struct. So that's the base ID, that's the overlay ID, and so on and so forth. And then I'm just returning that at the end. So now that it's in a struct format, you can literally just take that struct and just read that out. And so I'm just reading that to the texture as the blue channel of the display. And that's what you see at the end, just a blue smiley face. So the way the code works is that the colors on the splat map are represented on a 3D cube like this. This is a splat map, for example, and you can see the blue is representative of stone, the grass is represented by the green color, and the pink here is like a gravel deposit. And of course we have the sand, which is yellow. Now those colors are represented in here as points on this cube. So let's just say we had three points like this. Like that might be, I don't know, stone, for example, this could be the grass, this could be the, the beach or whatever. They're all represented as like how much green is in that color, how much blue is in that color, and how much red is in that color. So to select which material you must be, you can probably just select the nearest node. So that's a very simple way of doing it. You could just select the base color based on how close you are to those points. And that would technically work, but you wouldn't have any blending between each of the points. Now, of course, when you look at the actual splat map and when the program goes through the splat map, it might find a color that's, you know, somewhat between the blue and the green, for example, or somewhere between the pink and the green, because it kind of like fades like that. Now, logically, what would you want the terrain to do in that position? Uh, you'd think you'd want it to somehow blend between, say, the grass and the gravel, halfway between, based on how close to one color or the other color you are. And so that's exactly what you do in 3D. If the program reads a color, and it's about here, you know, about halfway, what it should do is it should put a material there that is halfway between the stone and the grass. And so the way that my program does it is that it checks all these intersecting lines between the points first. And it goes, okay, which one of these lines is closest to my point? Using a bit of vector math. And the one that's closest, let's say this one, for example, that one will be chosen as the overlay color. There is a fringe case where this doesn't work. And that's like, let's say where we've got a color like this, for example. This color is actually closer to this line here. And this line is connecting from the base color to a color that's very far away. You'd think that it'd be more appropriate for this color to actually look between this base color and this overlay color. That's the way I get around that is I use a Voronoi diagram in three dimensions to be able to only select the appropriate intersecting lines. So taking it down to two dimensions for a second. So this is the exact same idea, but flat. Let's say this is your base color. You never want the texture to lurk between this material and this material in the back here. You'd only want it to do to the neighbors. So that's what I do. When I iterate over each of these materials, I only check the lines of the neighbors that are adjacent to this cell. So these four, in this case, would be checked. In 3D, that means that this material would be completely ignored since it's not, it won't be neighboring this cell. So this one here gets ignored. And what instead happens is this color recognize that this is the closest line that connects the base color to an overlay color. So this overlay color will be selected. So once a base color and an overlay color 
can be selected, it's pretty simple vector arithmetic to be able to find out where on this line, how far along you are between the base and the overlay. And you just set that as your blend color. It's probably about a 50-50 split. So it sets the blending to about 50% between that base color and that overlay color. So here's how I do it in the code. So the first thing it does, of course, is it gets the original color that is displayed on the splat map. So that color that's on that splat map uh, is already a point in that cube. It's just a vector three of how red, how green, how blue it is. That's just a three-dimensional point. So I don't actually have to do anything with that. That's already correct. I then get the nearest base color. And I've actually made myself a little function here called get closest Veroni. And just like in Blender, when I'm showing you how you find the nearest color, this program just iterates over every single one of the materials, finds the one that is the closest, and returns it. And you could just do it from there. You could just use that chosen base as your material, and there would be no blending between. But the next bit is the funky bit, and this is, this is where you have to try and find the nearest connecting line segment. So this just works like this. It just iterates over every single material that happens to be in color space. It gets the color of that material. This section here just checks to see whether or not it is neighboring that cell. I won't explain that. So just ignore that. It just checks to see if it's a neighbor. And if it is a neighbor, it can do this next bit, which finds the connecting line with the smallest distance to the original point on the splat map. So back in Blender, what it just did is it found the base color to begin with. Then it iterated over every single one of the points finding the line that is closest, but ignoring this one while I did it, because it wasn't a neighbor. And so eventually it'll pick this one right here. Once it has the overlay color, you can find the nearest point on that line. So in Blender, this is just this point right here, the point that is nearest and on that line. And there you go, from there, it just does a little bit of arithmetic to be able to figure out how to blend it properly. So for example, if you're on this side, you want this to be the base color, this to be the overlay color, and it'd be 25% of the way there. But once you actually flick over the halfway, this one becomes the base color, and this one becomes the overlay color, and it's about, you know, 30% of that, that way. So this tiny bit of arithmetic just kind of messes, with, messes around with that, just to make sure that that works. Then you set the overlay ID and the base ID back onto the struct. This section here just boosts the blending slightly, such that the blending is more obvious. This is necessary because sometimes the height map of each of your materials aren't normalized. So you expect a blend of 128, which is the midpoint between zero and 255, 128 would be 50% of one texture and 50% of the other. However, so you might have one height map, let's say the grass, that is really strong, really like uh, the height map goes from like zero all the way to one, whereas a different height map, this stone doesn't actually, it's much smaller. So when you blend between the two, it shows up immediately and the 50% mark is a little bit higher. So this tiny bit of code just undoes that and makes it so the midpoint of the blend values is still showing 50% of both materials. Finally, it takes that struct and turns it back into a, an integer using the encode data function and sends that out to the EXR. The encoding works the same as the decoding, but instead of taking the integer on the control file and turning it into a struct, it just takes those individual elements, the base ID, the overlay ID, and just compresses them into the integer back in the control file. That's it. That's basically how it works. So taking it back to the C sharp side, once, of course, once it's been executed, it displays the data and it saves it as an EXR. And that's what we got. So I hope that was clear enough. Uh, if anybody has any questions about any more about it, just let me know. And if anybody wants to see another video on any other topic, any other topic whatsoever, you want to hear about compute shaders? Do you want to hear about voids? Do you want to hear about, I don't know, making a fluid simulation? Just leave a comment and I'll get to that as well. Thanks for watching and have a great day.